More than three decades ago, First Baptist Bernie used to be located on Main Street. But the church had a vision, and that was to purchase this beautiful piece of property. It was actually the highest point, is the highest point in Bernie, because we knew that the Lord was calling us to be the light on a hill. Matthew 5, we are the light of the world, shining the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all can see. It was really playing off that idea that we came up with the idea for Bernie Bright. Christmas lights, our culture is uh, fascinated with the beauty of lights against the darkness of the night sky and a Christmas walkthrough so that we could encounter and engage our community in such a way that we could, as they enter into the prayer garden, lay a hand on their shoulder, just pause for a moment and say, hey, is there something I can pray with you or your family about this Christmas time? If you haven't been through the walkthrough, we ask as people enter into the prayer garden to take a moment to fill out. There's two cards that we hand them. One that says, uh, what are you thankful for this Christmas? And the other says, I have prayer requests. Take those, write on them, roll it up, and stick it in our little wire wall, kind of like the... the Western Wall in Jerusalem, stick those in there as prayer request. What you see all across this stage this morning are those I'm thankful for and prayer requests right here. By the end of today, we'll have more than 5,000 people walk through Bernie Bright. Now, there is a commitment, a promise that we made as a team in the very beginning, and that is that we would pray over these prayer requests. Not just take them and dump them in the trash, not just as an exercise for people to do, but rather that we would pray with them. So I'm going to ask you to do something special at the conclusion of the service that is on your way out the door today, if you would come by and if you wouldn't mind grabbing a handful of them. There's probably close to a thousand of them, all right? Don't leave those all to me or to the staff. You come by pick those up. Some of them will say, I'm thankful for. Others will be prayer requests. Certainly, you and your family can handle three to five each. Read those and just pray over them because we genuinely trust God and prayer and the hope of the gospel. All right, grab your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We're going to continue our walk through the I Am series. And this morning, I want to call your attention to the incredible stained glass that is behind me as I preach every Sunday morning. You'll see in the bottom corner, it says, I am. These are, this is a picture of the seven I am statements that are are of Jesus here in John. Top left, you see, I am the bread of life. Bottom right, I am the light of the world. Uh, Bottom left, I am the door. In the very center, the very middle, at the top, it looks like the sun that, that spreads its rays and brings light to all of the others. That is this morning. I am the resurrection and the life. What an incredibly powerful picture of Jesus' statements. The declaration from the eternal God, from eternity past, the creator of all, the one who is without days. I am the resurrection and the life. That's our passage in John chapter 11. I need to give you a quick Aside before we jump into it, that is, as I narrate the text this morning, I'm going to be making slight assumptions because I want the text to come alive to you. In thinking through these two passages, there's Luke 10 and there's John 11, both detail Martha and Mary and Lazarus as a family. And I want to point out something that's a little different way of thinking than I've ever thought about it before. And that is, I think Lazarus is Martha and Mary's younger brother. Here's why I think that. Lazarus seems to be unmarried as you go through the text. 
because Martha and Mary are taking care of him, and he also seems to be at Martha and Mary's house. In Luke chapter 10, the house is called Martha's house. It doesn't even name Mary. It just says it's Martha's house. And at that point, there's actually no mention of Lazarus. And in John 11:5, you'll see me read this morning, there, is, there seems to be an order of, this, uh, of the family where Martha is named, Mary isn't even named, and then Lazarus is named, okay? I could be wrong. I'm not trying to make more of this than, than you can. Just know that as I try and make the text come to life, it's these details that I'm trying to piece together. Now, we're going to have a long reading. There's big chunks. I'll tell you what we're reading, but I do want you to stand so that the blood keeps flowing. So would you stand in honor of God's word this morning and listen as we read John chapter 11. I'm going to start with the first seven verses, then I'll tell you where we're skipping. By the way, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go up to Judea again. Now skip down to verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found uh, that he had already been in the tomb for four days now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she had heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the son of God, even he who comes into the world. Now skip down to verse 32. Therefore, when Mary came to where Jesus was, she said to him and fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And so the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and there was a stone lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them, they actually went to the Pharisees and told them all of these things which Jesus had done. 
You may be seated. And would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning needing to hear from you. That life comes with trials and difficulty, sometimes overbearing to our soul. Waves of grief and doubt and confusion. But you have come to shine light into that darkness. We beg your Holy Spirit this morning to breathe life into us, to lift our heads, to allow us to see and to hear the eternal truth that you are the resurrection and the life. Allow us to see that, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Martha is the firstborn of a prominent, affluent family that is well known even in Jerusalem. You see, it was natural for her to take the reins of the family business as she is driven, organized. She knows how to get things done. Martha's home is large. In fact, large enough to host influential guests from Jerusalem. And she cares deeply about making the best impression. She handles her nervous energy with busyness, sometimes to a fault, choosing perfection over people. She lives with her younger sister, Mary, and her younger brother, Lazarus. Mary is the nurturing sister who takes life as it comes. She chooses people over perfection. She is sensitive and soft-spoken but she is prone to paralyzing fear. You know, immobilized when life comes at you fast. And sometimes she can't see past the trial that she's in. Both Martha and Mary love their younger brother, Lazarus. Since their parents' untimely death, they had to raise him like their very own son. You see, it's Martha who drives him and Mary that's nurturing. And as you could imagine for two widowed sisters, he is their world. His illness has taken a serious turn, a turn for the worse. They are having shifts watching his bedside and round the clock. His fever won't break His body shakes violently. Where is Jesus? Where is he when we need him? They have not only heard, they have seen with their own eyes the miracles, the healings that he has done. Where is Jesus? You know, he is a close friend of theirs. He knows them each personally and loves them. Jesus is about a four days journey away. On the other side of the Jordan, continuing his ministry and evading the Jewish leaders who are seeking to kill him because of his claims to be the son of the living God. As Lazarus' condition worsens, They get news about Jesus' whereabouts and they send out a messenger. They say, go to him as fast as you can and tell him to come back here quickly because Lazarus' life depends upon it. And while they wait for Jesus' return, they sit at Lazarus' bedside, whispering encouraging words, hold on. Dear brother, just hold on. Jesus is on his way. He loves you. And when he gets here, he will make everything right again. 
Meanwhile, when they're not by his side, they are anxiously pacing, saying over and over in their mind, if, if Jesus were just here, if only Jesus were here. But time runs out. And Lazarus breathes his last. Just like that, he's gone. Why? Why, God? Why couldn't he hold on just a few more days? Why did Jesus have to be so far away? Why, God? And Lazarus' body is prepared and he's laid in a tomb, the family tomb, that evening and a stone rolled in front. As Martha and Mary sit in disbelief. The news spreads quickly. All the way to Jerusalem, people come to mourn with the family. On the second day after his death, the messenger returns. But shockingly, without Jesus. Did you find him? Yes. Well, where is he? He said this wasn't to end in death, but rather this was to turn out for the glory of God. Huh? That doesn't make any sense. He's already dead. Why didn't he come with you? He's been dead for two days. Where is he? I don't know. Well, what did you say to him? I, I told him, he whom you love is sick. And he just, he just got quiet. And then he said, I'm not coming back with you. process for a moment that you don't already know how this story ends. Sit in the weight of the grief of Mary and Martha as their dearly beloved brother and as the circumstances around them make no sense. Why didn't he come? You see, they expect, as we would, right, that Jesus would hear the news, would quickly find a, a horse and would mount it and would ride and charge through the night to get to his dear friend's side and to, and to save him. Or better yet, why, why, doesn't, he, why doesn't he heal from afar? He's already, he's already done that to the centurion servant. Just heal from afar. What reason could Jesus have for possibly delaying. Dear friend, listen to me. Because when from our perspective, we cannot comprehend delays, disappointments, betrayals, illness, or even death. Doubt creeps in. You begin to say, well, he doesn't care. He couldn't have reasons for this. How could he care? God has forsaken me. He has abandoned me without hope. The darkness is too dark. It overwhelms me. I cannot breathe. I've had friends who were adopting after nine years of infertility. And they felt called by the Lord to adopt from Nepal and they waited in line for adoption more than a year and a half. And as they waited their turn and waited their turn, it finally came close for it to be their time. And Nepal was shut down for scandals over adoption and you could no longer adopt from there. Does God care? When you pour your heart and your soul into your life's work, 
Believing that God called you to it. Stepping out in faith. Even putting your family's finances on the line. Only to see it crumble to the ground. Does God care? Your loved one is disabled by a freak accident. Forever changing the course of their life and yours. Why? Why did they have to be at that exact place at that exact time? Does God care? As we will see with the truth of this passage, you and I are invited to a higher plane. You are invited above the circumstances with an elevated perspective. Beloved, this narrative has been written because in this one, we get to pull back the curtain of this situation and circumstance. Even though in your situations, you don't always get to see behind the curtain, we can hear because this shouts, it has been done in kindness so that you and I can understand Jesus does care. He may have reasons for delaying or disappointment that are beyond our perspective, but hear me, it's not because he doesn't care. And there is a promise that he gives to each and every one of us. He promises to use it for the glory of his name. Two days After the messenger returns, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Jesus appears on the road with his disciples. Martha runs to meet him on the road, while Mary stays back at the house. As Martha rushes to meet him, She is bold enough to confront him with all the fears and the doubt of her heart. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you had been here. Now we will come back and examine the dialogue that takes place between the two of them. But hear me. You need to understand this. He doesn't rebuke her. Rather, he meets her right where she is in all of the emotion and in all of the anger and actually lifts her head with the most incredible theological truth that there is in all of Scripture. When Mary comes delayed She says the same words, but it's a different tone. She's broken, she says. If you had been here, where were you? Where were you? We feel so abandoned and alone. Where were you? And Jesus weeps with her. He weeps with her. Moments later, he is about to raise Lazarus from the dead and give him back to her. And he weeps with her. Because he sees where she is. And he's broken. Friend, Jesus is strong enough to handle your fiercest anger. And gentle enough to wipe your tears. With everything inside of me, I plead... Go to him. Go to him. Go to him. He is 
everything your heart longs for. He can handle all of it. Go to him. But now it is right for us to sweep back through the passage. But this time, for us to find the highest aim. Okay? There is a truth that is greater than the comfort of the brokenhearted. There is a truth that is even greater than Lazarus coming back from the grave. And to miss it is even more tragic than death. See it with me there in verse four. At the beginning, Jesus tells us <coughs> this sickness is not to end in death, but it is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified by it. This unfolding situation has the highest aim to reveal, to peel back the layers so that you can see, to reveal something about Jesus, something so glorious that it changes everything. A perspective so grand that it is worth the heartache and anguish that Martha and Mary have to walk through. Because Jesus loves them, he delays two days. And because Jesus loves you, he had John record this truth. Why does Jesus delay two days? Have you ever thought about this? Because if he had gone immediately, he gets there and Lazarus is two days dead. So why does he wait two days? What's the difference between Lazarus two days dead and four days dead? Have you ever heard stories of people being pronounced dead only to resuscitate? In 1915, a woman arrived late to her sister's funeral, upon which she demanded to see that the, her sister one last time, because she didn't get there in time. So they raised the coffin, they opened the lid, only to have Essie Dunbar sit up. She went on to live another 47 years. Before modern medical tests, although yes, it was very infrequent, it did occur. Now to account for this, in the ancient world, they believed that the soul or the spirit hovered over the body for three days and would occasionally re-enter, very rare, but would occasionally re-enter. So they believed that for three days, the, the spirit would hover there. But after the third day, so much decay would set in on the body that then the spirit would go to the other world. So why does Jesus delay two more days? Because he doesn't want there to be any doubt about what he is doing because it all claims on who he is. So when Martha meets him on the road and says, if you had been here, follow this dialogue. Pick it up in verse 23. Because Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. But this provides minimal comfort because she takes it like, yeah, 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 at the, at the end of time, yeah. Yeah, he'll rise again then. But you see, Lazarus is her world. His life was cut down in the prime of life. And so Martha said to him, yeah, I, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. My goodness. I am the resurrection. To quote Worsby, Jesus moved resurrection out of a statement of faith into a person. 
Out of the future and into the present. Hear me, we are so tempted to keep doctrine an arm's length away. Just head knowledge, stuff to affirm, but you can't do that here. You can't, that's Jesus' shocking movement. That's what he presses. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the bread, I am the light, I am the door, I am the resurrection. To know me is to be alive, eternally alive, even if the body dies. And to not know me is the exact opposite, it's to be spiritually dead. Even if your physical body is alive, if you do not know him, you are spiritually dead. See, the unsaved aren't simply sick because of their sins. They are dead in their transgressions and sins. But Lazarus knew Jesus. Lazarus knew Jesus. So when Jesus enters into the darkness that Martha and Mary are walking through, he is intentional to put his finger on their their misconceived ideas. He knows that they are keeping the promises over here and that there's really very little hope. It's, It's minimal comfort. And so he sees that, he realizes, and he presses in. He orchestrated the entire thing to reveal this truth. I am the resurrection and the life. You don't understand. Lazarus is more alive now than he's ever been. He's alive now more than he's ever been. And your loved one in Christ is more alive now than they've ever been. Now. In fact, they feel sorry for us because we see so dimly while they are in the presence of the Lord. Amen. They, they don't want to switch spots with us. They don't want to come back. That's the truth that Jesus unfolds. It is so important to understand To miss this is worth, is worse than the tragedy of death. Because here's the deal every one of us dies. To miss this is, is, is worse than even Lazarus being raised from the dead. What, how long is he gonna live after this? He's gonna get resurrected, he's gonna live 40, 50 more years, and then, then what? Same fate. Yeah, it's, it's tragic to be cut down in the prime of life and life is beautiful, it's a gift from God, but this truth is greater, so much higher. It elevates us above the circle. It gives us a perspective that changes everything. Every one of us dies once, our physical body. The question is, What about the second death? When you will stand before the holy, supreme judge of the entire universe and your account will be opened. If your faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he died and accounted for your sins, that they have been covered, then you will die once, you will not die that second death. 
And if you have placed your faith in him, the scripture says, right now you are eternally alive. Alive. That is my plea with you. I am eternally alive. And all across this room are men and women who are eternally alive. One day you will read in the newspaper and it'll say, Jason Smith, former pastor of First Baptist Bernie, has died. And you will pause and you will reflect back on life and the times we had and hopefully you will shed a tear and you will mourn and then you will quickly remember the hope that we have in Jesus. Eternally alive. I am the resurrection and the life. Now that is a pretty bold claim by Jesus. I mean, if you are standing there with Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life, that's a pretty bold claim. So you know what he does? He walks over to the grave and proves it. He goes, Lazarus is alive. Can I show you? Come here. Now, when you follow the narrative, they don't quite get what's taking place, right? She head nods in the moment, right? These deep theological truths. Sure, yes, Jesus, we believe that. Then we walk over to the grave and she's like, "Uh uh-uh. Four days, stinky. No, it's gonna be gross. Rolls the stone away and he calls Lazarus forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Amen. O oh, death, where is your sting? Because the one who is greater than death is here. And he called him forth. And therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. You bet they did. You bet they did. But some of them, can you imagine this? But some of them, they went to the Pharisees. They told of the things that he had done. They circle up and they make the statement, we better kill him because too many people are going to go after him. This led to Jesus' death. So catch this. In Jesus' quest to bring his friend Lazarus back from the dead, Jesus assures his own death. Isn't that the gospel? Friend, Jesus died to bring you life. He is the resurrection. And either you need that truth like you need air, or you are dead in your sins, just like the Pharisees. I came across this video last week. I promise you, you will weep, and I don't apologize for it, okay? It's a daughter at her father's funeral, and in 90 seconds... She proclaims the gospel in the most profound way that you could ever imagine. This truth of what we're talking about this morning, that he is the resurrection and the life. Check it out. I remember having conversations with my dad about him losing friends and officers in the line of duty. I have heard all the stories you can think of, but I've always had such a hard time with how the suspect is dealt with. Not that I didn't think there should be justice served, but my heart always ached for those who don't know Jesus. Their actions being a reflection of that. I was always told that I would feel differently if it happened to me, but as it's happened to my own father, I think I still feel the same. There has been anger, sadness, grief, and confusion. And part of me wishes I could despise the man who did this to my father. But I can't get any, of, any part of my heart to hate him. 
all that I can find is myself hoping and praying for this man to truly know Jesus. I thought this might change if the man continued to live. But when I heard the news that he was in stable condition, part of me was relieved. My prayer is that someday down the road, I'd get to spend some time with the man who shot my father. Not to scream at him, not to yell at him, not to scold him, simply to tell him about Jesus. With every head bow and every eye closed, do you know him as the resurrection and the life? If you do not hear me, hear his voice. He is calling to you. Would you bow the knee? Would you surrender to him as king? Would you place all of your faith, all of your hope, all of your trust in his finished work to make you right before a holy God? He is the resurrection and the life. All you have to do is cry out right now to him. He has drawn near so that you could. If you are here this morning and you do know him, press into him more. Press into him. He is life. And we so easily get distracted. But he is life. And he is greater than any circumstance, any hurt, any obstacle, any confusion, any doubt. He is greater. And he has come to you to lift your head. King Jesus, we love you. With everything in us, we want to know you more. We want to drink more deeply and more fully of you and your love. We kneel at the foot of the cross, longing to hear your voice to refresh us again and again and again that you are the resurrection and the life. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.